ignored okay. got it moving ahead now coming to the 1053 rule so whenever people are looking to ये मीटिंग रिकॉर्ड हो रही है सॉरी आई कूड हियर समवन फॉक्स कैन यू प्लीज म्यूट योरसेल्फ व्हाइल द सेशन इज गोइंग इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस जस्ट पुट इट इन द चैट और वी विल हेल्प यू लाइक लेट यू आंसर लाइक आस्क एनी क्वेश्चंस यू हैव टुवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ द सेशन बट प्लीज वी वुड रिक्वेस्ट इफ यू ऑल कैन कीप योरसेल्फ म्यूटेड परफेक्ट so talking about when you invest your money in particular assets or investment opportunities remember you primarily have either you're putting money in an fd or a very secure government related asset or you're putting it in a debt security or you're putting in something which is equity related from a long term perspective management or long term projection a lot of people will tell you that equity markets give a 15% uh annual growth and stuff but when you are projecting how much this money is going to grow in the future remember don't take more than 3% as the return for whatever you put in an fd don't take more than 5% as an expectation of return from debt instruments and don't take more than 10% as a return from your equity investments so this is the 1053 rule where you divide it as an expected futuristic annual return on equity debt and bank fd someone had commented about fd yes coming to that soon enough next please so what is the rate of inflation in india if people could just put put that in the chat box um last year's inflation figure for india your options are given at the bottom i am looking for some answers please some educated guesses no one pawan 4.2 okay someone says 4.2 anyone who thinks otherwise 4.2 6.2 okay 5.2 okay 6.2 7.2 okay now that we've got an entire range let me tell you i'll break it to you last year's inflation figure was 6.2% which means if you've put money um in a bank deposit or in any investment which has given you a return less than 6.2% and there's a possibility you may be thinking that okay my money is in in an fd which is giving me 8% return okay fds are currently not giving 8% return but if anyone feels his uh, investment is giving 8% return and that interest remember is also taxable so if you are in the 30% bracket reduce that by 30% your net of tax is the return that you've actually got and if it's less than 6.2% during the year you've actually lost money to inflation because all your expenses have increased at a rate of 6.2% but your money hasn't increased at the same rate which is why it's important for you when you pick investment assets please identify and take those which give you a net tax return of more than the rate of inflation year after year after year next slide please the rule of 70 so normally what you do is for example if the inflation rate is 7% i'm rounding up 6.2 to 7 in how many years will will your sum or some saving kept in a normal savings account or kept uh in say for example your normal bank account or in cash it's kept in a locker in how many years will the purchasing power of that money reduce to half that is the rule of 70 so if inflation is rising at 7% per annum you take 70 divided by 7 you get 10 so in 10 years your sum of money today its purchasing power will reduce to half this is the rule of 70 to calculate impact of inflation next please rules of 72 and 114 so rule of 72 is fairly related to rule of 70 where we try and identify at what rate should you be investing your money so that your money doubles okay so if again by this logic we're looking at say we we've invested money in an fd which is giving us 6% per annum so 72 divided by 6 that's 12 so your fd if you are making 1 lakh today 1 lakh ka fd in 12 years you will get 2 lakh back as a redemption amount that's your rule of 72 and rule of 114 is in how much time will your money triple in size given the rate of return so what you'll do is your numerator is 72 for example when you look to in how much time will it double your denominator will either be your rate of return or the number of years so if you want to see if you want to see okay i am getting 
money at 10% per annum in how many years will it double in size so you take 72 divided by 10 in 7.2 years it's double or your goal should be that okay i want my money to double in 6 years so i'll take 72 divided by 6 that means i need to invest at 12% per annum to double it in 6 years that's how you look at these rules next one please 100 minus age rule fairly simple that if you are 30 at least 70 percent of your investing portfolio you should try and do it in equities if you're 40 try at least 60 percent of your savings portfolio is in equities so as your age increases the share of equity in your overall investment portfolio keeps reducing why because equity is a long-term investment i normally recommend that anyone who puts in money in equities should try and forget about it for minimum 10 years because at any point that any person in India or even across the world has put money in the stock markets and they've waited 10 years, they've always made money regardless of your scam 92 crash or any other depression in, in any market across the world, be it in the US, be it in India, wherever. If you've put in money and it has been invested for 10 years, the stock market has played its entire cycle and giving, given you a return where you haven't lost money. So, which is why if, if, it's, if your horizon is less than 10 years, there is a possibility you may actually lose money because you may have invested at a high and you may be withdrawing money when it's at an all-time low. Next, please. The 24-10 rule. So, when you're looking to buy a car, remember a car is a depreciable asset. It actually makes more financial sense for you to take an Uber everywhere. Um, you know, instead of buying a car, when you buy a car, 30% of the value of the car goes away as soon as you drive it out of the showroom and you try and selling it. You know, the, the best quote that you can possibly get is 80% of the price. Um, which is why when if you're looking to buy a car, follow this rule. Um, try and ensure that you spend no more than six months of your income on buying a car which is assuming that you will use the car for 10 years, try and spend no more than six months of your income. So if you're earning one lakh per month after taxes, after everything, you know, that's your take home. So don't buy a car, which costs you more than six lakh. That's a basic thumb rule. Um, 2410 here stands for that. If you're also taking a car loan, try and pay 20% of the cost of the car as a down payment. Take a loan, which doesn't go beyond four years. So you should be able to repay it in four years. And your EMI should ideally not be more than 10% of your monthly disposable income, which is your EMI payment, your fuel cost, uh, your car repair cost should ideally not be more than 10% of your monthly income. That's another way to calculate what should be the value of the car that you buy. Next slide, please. Okay, so types of investment options, we've categorized it as if you want to invest in stock markets, you can do it directly uh, through equities by um, you know, buying direct stocks of you want to buy stocks of Infosys, of, of uh, TCS, of any other company. If you don't want to pick individual stocks, you can also invest through equity mutual funds, which is a pool of all these stocks that the mutual fund company is doing for you. You can invest in sectoral funds, which is, which is you can decide to invest in, say, either IT or infrastructure or finance, any such particular sector. Index funds is when you invest directly in Nifty and Sensex. So these are passive funds. You're just, so your portfolio manager will keep changing the holding in your mutual fund portfolio. This is what is the holding on that day in the Nifty or Sensex, depending on which index you are investing in. Large cap, mid cap and small cap is a classification done for equities, depending on how big is the company. So large cap would possibly be the top, say 50 to 100 companies um, of, of, the, the country listed on the stock exchange, that's your large cap. Then you come to mid cap and small cap. Small cap comes with a higher chance of growth, but it is also more risky because these are much smaller companies. ESG funds, okay. So ESG stands for environment, sustainability, and growth. And also environment, societal, and governance related funds. So primarily ESG stands for environment, sustainability, or, or society, and growth or governance. People use these terms interchangeably, but these days ESG is used as more like a buzzword to sell investments. So, you know, primarily your 
portfolio manager or your investment manager should be looking at stocks or investment avenues of companies which are environmentally sound which care about society which care about their employees which care about not polluting the environment and which follow good governance because people want to invest in these companies for their own conscience and for the betterment of the world however since in india there is no particular standard to define what is good esg or bad esg almost all mutual fund companies have started funds and started calling them esg basis their own arbitrary metrics and everyone is putting money in it so this is also an avenue where people can really fool you by calling something esg but their metric of esg may be completely different from your understanding of esg the sebi is trying to plug that gap by defining certain standards around esg but for the time being know that this is also a marketing gimmick at this time ELSS stands for equity linked saving scheme so these are your equity mutual funds again if you want to invest in debt there is debt mutual funds corporate bonds uh, which is companies borrowing money from investors corporate debentures covered bonds and of course as you know credit is trying to get into p2p lending um, non banking financial corporations a lot of apps on lending that's where you can invest your money but remember p2p lending is very very risky so might as well avoid that low risk investments are bank fd government bonds rbi bonds sovereign gold bonds we'll be covering a few of these um, in the coming slides including ppf and nps which are great tax saving investments and i'll explain their features soon others you could be looking at investing in cryptocurrency non fungible tokens or nft art um, archaeological finds startups remember this others bucket is extremely risky so if you're someone who's not very very rich try and put only that much amount of your total investment in the portfolio which you have no problems losing even if it comes down to zero you're happy taking that risk but i'm not saying don't invest in it just no don't put all your savings in it next slide please now how to buy gold a lot of people feel that you know in their investment pool they've invested in equity they've invested in debt they're very smart uh, gold may normally they think that um, you know i am going to inherit jewelry from my parents because my family tends to have some gold savings but jewelry or tangible gold is actually not the best way to be invested in gold and even if you are looking to buy gold as an investment jewelry is horrible because if you go to sell it tomorrow it will remove 25% of its value anyway which goes into making charges so it doesn't make sense the next aspect is gst which is roughly 3% of the cost of physical gold which is again a loss to you so essentially try that if you have to stay away from physical gold and let's look at more digital options so you would have digital gold or you would have gold mutual funds gold mutual funds are investing in such securities of different types which are invested in gold these could be gold loans these could be gold bonds of the government bunch of these assets but looking at digital gold when you buy digital gold it's on an app so there are several uh, apps like there is augment gold there is safe gold um what happens though is you are still paying gst so that gst 3% is an expense for you and there is also some transaction charge so it costs you money a better way to be invested in gold to remove all these expenses in the transaction is to buy sovereign gold bonds of the government so this is something that the rbi releases every quarter uh, they will tell you that okay this is the rate of gold that we are taking so you can invest say a minimum of a uh, 10 uh, minimum of 1 gram of gold they tell you you can buy that little bit amount say roughly around 5000 worth of gold is the minimum ticket size that you need to put in there is no gst on it there is no expenses on it also a big tax saving is that if you sell these bonds after 8 years where you redeem them the rbi takes them back whatever is the capital gain or capital appreciation on that gold that's not taxed um in all other cases be it selling of physical gold or selling of digital gold when you sell it the capital gain is subject to tax which is not there in sovereign gold gold bonds plus the sgbs also give you a 2.5% per annum interest at simple interest on a half yearly basis so that's in addition to the um capital appreciation next slide please okay 
Now, coffee can investing is if you want to pick stocks yourself, you don't want to invest in mutual funds. You want to be able to identify okay, what kind of stocks should I be buying? Um, this is one way for you to pick those stocks. So you can basically coffee can investing. The name comes from the fact that um, several years ago, this was in the 1970s in the US. Um, Mr. Robert Kirby gave this name. Where what had happened was in in the wild west of the US, a few people had bought stocks, paper stocks. paper shares of companies and to save them from rodents and to save them from moisture had stuffed them in tin coffee cans and those tin coffee cans they had uh, you know kind of placed securely in their attic or in their basement and they forgot about it when 10 years later they kind of dug out those cans and took out those shares and saw the value of those stocks the stocks had increased in value by over 50% and ended up making all of these people extremely wealthy which is how this term comes in so to be able to identify stocks which can really make that kind of money you would go to a website like a screener.in it's spelled as s c r w e n e r .in and you will put in these three filtration criteria so screener.in gives you a list of all the stocks in in the country and you can look at several metrics to analyze them so one you can put in a criteria of a market capitalization of over 1000 crores the second is for a 10 year period their return on capital employed is a minimum of 15% and the revenue for 10 years has been growing at over 10% per annum if you put these stocks these are basically identifying high growing stocks in further of course when you have that shortlist you should be looking at okay where is the industry going do you believe in the industry you may want to read the um, annual reports of these uh, companies and analyze it further but this is how you at least make a basic portfolio short list of stocks you should be investing in next please ppf okay so because people who are employees actually have their employers uh, depositing money in provident fund for them however as freelancers you need to take care of your own retirement fund ppf is one such option which is backed by the government so it's extremely low risk um you can only invest in it if you are a resident indian um you have to invest a minimum of 500 rupees per annum and you can invest up to 1 and 1/2 lakhs um this is also tax deductible under section 80c so it will reduce your taxable income um there is a lock in of 15 years which really deters a lot of people but i would say when you're looking at your investment pool it always makes sense to not have all your money or a majority of your money in very high risk assets also try and put some amount in like safe long term assets and i think ppf is a great such investment option because even from a return perspective it gives you 9% roughly around 9% per annum return which is actually great for a risk free asset um the interest that you get of course lately has been seen to be 7% it's all tax free so if you compare it to taxable returns it it comes to 9% or more if at any point you feel you still need some money you can also take a loan against your ppf balance of 25% of the balance from the bank if you really do need money because this is locked in for 15 years um however of course god forbid if there are cases like a life threatening disease or you need to go for higher education in those cases you can prematurely close the account and take the money next slide please okay equity link saving schemes are basically mutual funds which invest more than 65% of the amount in equities and the remaining could be put in say government deposits or debts uh, there is a minimum lock in of 3 years and long term capital gain of up to 1 lakh 1 lakh of gain that you've made beyond 3 years is not taxable any gain beyond that is taxable at only 10% or uh, tax so it's a great scheme it also gives you the tax benefit so there are tax saving elss where you get that atc 1.5 lakh limit you can instead of putting it in ppf you can also put money in elss if this is more suited to your risk profile and like it in addition to the 1.5 lakh that you put in atc tax saving investments you also get an additional 50000 worth of deduction by putting money in the national pension scheme um this is a great you know secure asset so to say backed by the government which gives you the option to hold some of it in equities some of it in debt some of it in aifs or high risk assets so it's subject to active or passive management which means that 
when you are creating an nps account for yourself it's going to ask you okay what kind of an investor would you like to be would you want to be aggressive would you want to be moderate or would you want to be conservative and you can also define okay i want up to say 60% of my money to be invested in equities and a particular other percentage to be invested in debt you can actually set those rules in nps but remember as you grow older uh, the amount that you input in nps that you can put in equities in nbs is going to keep reducing because even they realize as people grow older they should not be putting in a major chunk of their money in equity related instruments also when you make an nps account online um you will be able to pick your fund manager so it'll show you sbi fund management kotak hdfc bunch of these options so depending on whichever fund manager you believe more in or whichever brand you like more you can pick i want sbi to say manage my portfolio you will not be able to withdraw this money before the age of 60 at the age of 60 60% of your total balance you can withdraw and the remaining you get as a monthly pension that's nps for you let's go to the next slide please perfect so how do you pick a mutual fund if you want to invest money firstly identify what is your goal and duration if you are looking to invest for an amount or for a period less than 5 years you are saving for higher education or something else then go for liquid funds or debt funds which come with lower maturity and don't face as much volatility so it, they may give you lower return but at least it shouldn't happen that in 5 years time the stock market is down and you don't even get money that you've invested in and if of course you are invested for more than 5 years you may look at equities or sectoral funds look at the risk appetite while investing in debt funds please read the credit and default risk uh, of of the asset it is mandatorily required by all websites that you are purchasing to be given this you could look at the sharp ratio or the soltino ratio which basically tells you that for one unit of risk taken by this fund what is the total return so there's a possibility that when you are comparing two mutual funds one gives you a return of 15% per annum the other gives you a return of 12% per annum so you may naturally think that 15% per annum is better however if you look at the sharp ratio it may turn out that the 15% guy is taking a much higher risk so right now because it's a bull market he's taken a higher risk and he's made more money but tomorrow when the stock markets go down you know his return will fall much steeper than the one which has a more stable or lower sharp ratio which means if someone is taking no risk or very minimal risk and giving you 12% and someone else is taking very high risk and giving you 15% so this gives you a risk you know adjusted understanding of okay which mutual fund is better so don't just go by returns you should also have a metric to understand risk as i mentioned large cap are the top 100 companies mid cap is 101 to 250 and small cap are 250 and onwards fees and load normally um, you will see that there is for actively managed funds where a portfolio manager sits and decides okay i should put this much percentage in this particular sector in it i should put say 10% of um, the the pools money in maybe itc or zomato or um, you know some other particular company bases their own understanding or analysis that's an actively managed fund the fees for an actively managed fund is also higher because there's someone who's been employed to do all of this analysis passive fund is something where you don't have anyone doing this basic analysis you are essentially putting money in nifty and sensex and saying that if the top 50 companies of the country grow i am going to grow with them and of course other factors to consider are look at liquidity look at the fund manager a lot of people what they do is they will try and see okay who's the fund manager for this particular fund um even if you invest using apps like grow and zerodha when you look at mutual funds it will give you the name in the details it will give you the name of the fund manager you could a lot of people actually tend to go online and look at the history of that fund manager how educated is he what is his uh, credibility like in the market that's something you can look at next slide please okay how to buy health insurance Uh, insurance is something that most people don't understand what i'll do is i'll try and cover some basic aspects of what you should be looking at use this as a checklist 
that when you are buying or renewing insurance, you can ask your insurance agent these specific questions. Also, don't buy insurance from your banker because they will, in most cases, sell you a horrible policy on which they make maximum money, as do insurance agents, even if it is someone who is trusted by the family. Um, I normally recommend that you buy it using an online insurance provider and use this checklist to ask them the right question and then take the decision. So ensure that what should be the value of coverage? It should be minimum six months of your enhanced salary, but in no case should your insurance be less than five years. The insurer should have most big brand hospitals of the city that you're living in, in the cashless network. The cashless network is if today, God forbid, I need to go to the hospital for any surgery or any accident. Uh, there's one way is that I pay money and later I get a reimbursement from the insurance company. However, if it's cashless, it means I don't need to pay anything. The insurance company will pay the hospital. So ensure that in the cashless network list, the best hospitals of your city are located or are included. You should also look at um, the claim settlement ratio, which should ideally be above 90%. You would notice when you buy from a place like maybe Policy Bazaar online, almost all companies advertise their claim settlement ratio because they know this is probably the only thing customers look at, which is how many of the total claims or what percentage of the total claims are actually paid by the insurance company. So this is something that they will flash and advertise, but know that there is much more that you need to question and look at, which normally remains hidden. So you could either as a freelancer buy a policy for yourself or you can buy a floater policy, which basically covers everyone in your family. But remember, if you have parents who are senior citizens or above the age of 60, it may make better sense for you to not include them in the family floater policy and buy separate policies for them. It may just turn out to be more economical because if you include them in the floater policy, it will hike up the policy premium for the total family as a whole. Um, Waiting period is a clause which tells you that if today you bought a new health insurance policy and if the waiting period is two years, it means for the next two years, if you get any of these list of diseases or ailments or anything, the insurance company will not pay for it because these are particular illnesses which develop over a long period of time and we don't know if these are developing in your body. So waiting period and the list of ailments is important to consider. Uh, ideally, pick a policy which has a lower waiting period of two years ideally or, or lesser if you can find any, don't go for three or four years. So you may find three or four year waiting period policies to be much cheaper. So don't go by the price, look at this particular metric. Based on your needs, you may also want to consider taking a policy which has which covers existing illnesses or daycare procedures. This is very important. So for example, if you need a root canal or something and you want the insurance company to pay for it, they'll say it's a daycare procedure, it is not covered. Um, a bunch of other surgeries, actually, the hospital doesn't require you to stay overnight. So you can go in the morning, get operated on, and be released the same day. The insurance company will say it's a daycare procedure. It's not covered, which is why I ensure this is covered. Critical illness coverage means that uh, if, God forbid, you get cancer or, or some such horrible disease, God forbid, um, the insurance company will not ask you for specific bills or anything to reimburse expenses. They will just say if this uh, illness is diagnosed, the company will release the specific sum of say 25 lakh, 30 lakh, 50 lakh, whatever is the coverage in one go to help you meet all those expenses. Room rate is a terrible, horrible, devilish clause. What it means is, so say for example, you've taken a policy of 10 lakh and you think that, okay, this particular procedure is going to cost 5 lakh. So this is going to get covered by my insurance. However, the insurance policy says that there is a room rate cap of say, 3,000 uh, per day and say the hospital you've taken the quote from charges 6,000 per day for the room. So what the insurance company will do is only reimburse 50% of the entire expense. So if the procedure costs 5 lakh, you'll only get 2.5 lakh from the insurance company and the remaining you'll have to shell out from your own pocket. So try and take a room rate which is higher as possible, which is corresponding to the room rates in at the best hospitals in your city. Home payment clause requires you to co-pay a particular percentage. So try and see if you want full coverage instead of co-payment. Pre and post hospitalization expenses, they'll say that say 30 days before the procedure and for 60 days after the procedure, whatever expenses you make on lab tests, on um, medicines, on doctor OPD charges will also be reimbursed. 
so if you take a, a pre period of 60 days and post period of 180 days that's actually best then there's no no claim bonus zonal coverage uh, reasonable customary super top up okay so i think basic i've covered on the top the rest is you can read uh, next slide please how to buy life insurance okay so when you go around um, seeking assistance on what kind of policy to buy there are primarily two types of policies one is a term insurance the other is an endowment or a ulip plan the difference is in a term insurance they say that okay if you've taken a term insurance up to the age of 60 if you die at any time before the age of 60 you will not get uh, you will get the entire amount of coverage however if you don't die you will not get anything in return so you will only get money your family will only get money if you die before the term expires however in an endowment plan they will say okay you put in this much premium every year and if you die of course your family is going to get this much money if you don't die you still get money back whatever you've invested you get the same amount back and this all agents will try and sell us this amazing like scheme that this is how can the insurance company be so benevolent that it's giving you your premium back and still providing you insurance so this is where people get fooled because they are essentially if they've taken 10000 per annum for 10 years okay so they'll say you've given them 1 lakh rupees and they'll give you 1 lakh back at the end of 20 years that's amazing no it's not amazing because if say a term policy could be for 4000 per annum and the same coverage policy for endowment is uh, 10000 per annum you are giving them 6000 extra per annum to get 1 lakh at the end of 20 years or something if you were to put that 6000 in any other investment avenue you would end up making much more money than that so essentially what they are doing is here they are taking money from you putting it in great investments making return and giving you just a very small sum of that return back so they are actually earning from your money so don't buy endowment and ulip policies even the best of endowment policies do not match any return that you can get by investing yourself in even say index funds so what should be the term so ideally most people decide that term to be 65 that um, till the time if if they die before 65 their family should get money if not then nothing uh you should also estimate in terms of year you could also invest, estimate that um, okay you know by by the age of 50 i feel i will have enough savings enough everything my children will be big, old enough that even if i got for bit die my family will not be left to the streets having some loan on their head or something um that they will have to pay off so your term can actually be lower and how much should the life insurance cover be it should ideally be 15 to 20 times your annual salary or your annual take away right now and another way to calculate this is you take your current expenses yours as well as your dependents on a monthly basis multiply that by 150 this 150 figure also takes into account inflation so just take your current monthly expenses multiply that by 150 and reduce add to it any liability so if you've taken any loan you know god forbid if you were to die tomorrow your family would have to repay that loan and your source of income would be gone which is why add to the coverage your loan amount that is outstanding and reduce from it any savings that you have in liquid uh, assets that the family can kind of take off to pay off that loan this is another mathematical way to calculate it okay next slide yes um how is a term insurance priced so the sooner you buy a term insurance the better it is normally a lot of policies you will get at say 1 crore worth of term insurance at 7000 per annum so say for example if you are buying a term insurance of 1 crore at the age of 25 you will have to pay 7000 per annum for say 10 years um and if you buy it at say the age of 35 you might have to pay 17000 per annum for 10 years for the same coverage because the date or the year in which you buy term insurance your premium gets fixed so the sooner you buy it the lower premium you actually pay how to filter insurers for selection so if you go to policy bazaar as an example not endorsing them but as an example if you go to policy bazaar and put filters look at claim settlement ratio should ideally be more than 97% um look at claim rejection ratio to be less than 1% you could also look at asset under management which means how much total holding or pool pool of money does the 
um, insurance company have. So the higher the asset under management, more secure your funds would seem to be. Um, let me also tell you, LIC has the highest AUM in the country. The amount of money they hold is more than the money held by the um, by the state of Pakistan. That's the amount of money LIC has. And of course, you want to trust a good brand which is going to remain um, even 30 years from now because that's where your insurance repayment can actually come from. So go for trusted brands like SBI, HDFC or whichever brand you trust. What kind of extra riders could you consider buying? You could take a critical illness cover along with your life insurance. Um, you could also take an accidental disability that say, for example, if you meet with an accident and you are disabled, you would not have to pay premium anymore. Next slide, please. Other important factors to consider is you may want to get a physical medical test um, before buying insurance just as a proof of fitness so that you are completely healthy and the insurance company can't say that you already had an existing illness which you did not disclose. Also, please do state um, in the form if you have any habits that could impact your health, like smoking or drinking. Perfect. Let's move on. Now, from a retirement planning perspective, this is what freelancers should follow. Ensure that you're contributing at least to NPS or PPF of an amount of a lakh and a half per annum. This is your long-term planning. You must put it in at least one of these investment avenues in addition to whatever you're putting in equities. Buy medical insurance covering at least six months salary. Buy life insurance, which is 15 to 20 times your annual income. Maintain an emergency fund that on an immediate basis, you should have at least six months money. In five years, you should have at least two years worth of money. And in 10 years, you should have at least five years of no pay. That's the amount of saving you have to do. Plan to eliminate all possible debt in the next five to 10 years and prepare an Excel sheet or an inventory list of all your assets, your investments, your holding, where God forbid if anything happens to you, your family should know where you've kept what and how to access those funds. Uh, you must create your will, even if you're a young person, but if, if you have a family, if you have kids, um, if you have a spouse, it's important that you create a will. It doesn't need to be registered in, in any court. It's not mandatory. So even if on a plain piece of paper, you write in your own handwriting that if I'm no longer there in this world, whatever is in my bank account goes to my wife or whatever is in, held in these manners go to my children or to my parents in whatever format, you can sign it, write it, keep it in a locker. That is a valid will. In COVID, unfortunately, people have lost a lot of people who are also middle-aged who thought it wasn't their age to write wills. And which is being a chartered accountant in practice, I've genuinely seen cases where families don't even know what the person held. Moving on. Perfect. So these are my coordinates. I make a lot of content on personal finance and investing on Instagram. The same content goes up on LinkedIn, on YouTube every single day. I've posted every single day for the past eight months. And a lot of what I've covered will be covered in more detail in my existing videos. I also make a lot of content around startups, fundraising, how to scale your business, which is something which we haven't covered in our presentation today, but I do a lot of startup fundraising and consulting and business related advisory. Um, the house is open for questions. So if you want me to answer anything, I'm all yours. Patrick, should I stop the screen share? Absolutely. Okay. You know, I have a question. How, how did you manage to get so many degrees? And your LinkedIn bio also says uh, <laughs> you have so many degrees. How, how did you manage to do that? No, I don't know. I think it wasn't planned really. Immediately after 12th, I signed up for like four degrees in one go. I took the entrance for four and I thought, okay, let me just keep trying to juggle between exams. So yeah, I, I was very, very lucky, really. And as people say, yeah, yeah, baal humne so <laughs> it's, it's really taken a lot of effort. Uh, okay, there are, there are multiple questions and, and I've just noted it down and I'm going to take one by one starting like right from the very beginning. The first question is, does PPF fall under ATC or it uh, is in it a does. different? It does. 
so when when it's under atc uh, your els is under so, atc so els is covered in atc life insurance premium is covered under atc um ppf is covered under money. atc so all of these are investments that you are making for the long term and from your taxable income one and a half lakh gets reduced and there is no tax that you have to pay on it remember from an elss perspective though not every elss is a tax saver covered under atc you need to buy a tax saver elss which has a lock in of 3 years mm-hmm. but and also pf is also under atc itself that's right and the maximum cap is 1.5 lakhs for it in a year that's right got it and nps is in a different uh, category so that's what's right. limit for nps so nps is you can invest a minimum of 500 you will have to invest per annum up to 50000 per annum is what will give you tax exemption up to 50000 but if you want to invest more you have the freedom to invest as much as you want got it got it uh, before i move on to more questions i'm going to request folks here again to turn on their videos because it, it's just right now feeling like we're talking to some text instead of human so please would request if you all can uh turn on your cameras and then uh we'll address as many questions as we can in the next 10 15 minutes uh one more question here sarthak is how how to go about equity dilution how much to dilute after every round yeah so this is something i did not cover in my presentation but uh, this is very subjective if you want a thumb rule equity dilution is basically it it means for the benefit of others that you are a startup and you are raising funds so how much share in your company should you give away to an investor to raise more funds a general rule of thumb is in every round initially founders tend to give away 20% of their company uh in return for raising funds if you were to look at uh, accelerators or incubators like basically y combinator is a us accelerator mm-hmm. which if it picks a startup it also trains the entrepreneurs on how to make their product better how to sell it better and they also invest about um, 125000 into the business and roughly take about 15% equity so when they say 15% equity if at the beginning the founder held 100% of the equity at the end or after taking that money from the investor they hold only 85% because they've sold 15% of their equity so thumb rule is 20% but it doesn't stop founders if if you have great credibility um if you're a second time founder or you have great execution skills uh, you have a great network maybe you could do with a 10% dilution also so there's no hard and fast rule remember 20% is like an industry benchmark but you should try and dilute no more than 15% in any round and for that have like a good negotiator consultant legal advisor with you who can negotiate on your behalf with the investor through legal clauses and finances so that they don't make a fool out of you all right uh, there is a very interesting question by ankit where he is asking how to stick to the 50 30 rule especially when your monthly take home take away home varies greatly depending on the amount of work every month and i think this is very very relevant to a lot of freelancers who don't have retainer clients or like annual clients whatever absolutely so i think i'm also a freelancer i run a firm also so on whatever i do on a freelancing basis i do set like most people monthly targets and maybe when i look at the end of the year i may have earned say 100 rupees per month so for the year i want like 1200 so i know 100 rupees is my average but i may have a target threshold of no matter what in no month can i afford to earn less than 50 even if i earned 500 in the previous month in this month i have to earn minimum 50 so by that logic i would say you know have a minimum threshold of what is the minimum you have to take home and that really pushes you so i would say in today's time and age i would really say that people should try and earn if you are living in metro if you have rent to pay if you are an individual above the age of 25 i would say minimum 1 lakh per month take away after all your expenses is important to be also be able to save have good you know your ambition should be at least that 
and we can do more sessions on how to like improve your sales how to get more money i also do sessions on how to price and really ask without offering any discount and bloody get that money in your pocket from a customer so don't think that for anyone i would say never think that in today's time in india if you're a freelancer and 1 lakh per month is really really very doable and can be done so if it really intimidates anyone i think we must find ways and processes to really increase that figure for you and it is really possible in today's time the next question is by prathamesh where he is asking could you dive a little deeper into index funds how do i gauge these funds when thinking of investing okay so index funds are primarily you are investing in the index which is nifty or sensex uh, personally speaking i don't invest in direct equities because if you invest in direct equities you need a lot of time to to do justice to it you need a lot of time to study those companies their financial statements what are their ratios like and you know track keep tracking it over a period of time is this industry doing well what is happening to the management now that takes away time from my everyday you know life of work plus i personally feel if i have to invest time in something i rather do it in upskilling because i think it gives a much higher return than any other investment can do so if i have to devote 2 to 2 hours every day to investing i rather than studying financials of other companies i improve my skills spending 2 hours every day i think i'll be able to generate much more money for myself so by that logic uh, when you invest in index funds you pick either a sensex based fund or you pick either a nifty based fund and your by uh, by default investing in the biggest 50 companies in the country now know that most actively managed funds in fact 95% of the actively managed funds are unable to beat the market which means even if you are putting money in an actively managed fund you are paying higher expense ratio for uh, for some analyst to find out okay what is the best way to put the money and still is unable to beat your simple nifty and sensex now who you need to pick between hdfc has a sensex fund uh, icici prudential icici securities may have a, a sensex fund uh sbi may have it just go with a brand you trust or go with someone who has least amount of expense ratio another thing you can um, look at is there is a minor difference okay between the return of the nifty and of an index fund why because say the nifty changes today now the fund manager will take maybe an hour to execute that change in his portfolio also so times what happens is the return differs slightly based on this lag in executing the change in the portfolio uh, which is why if if that lag or that difference in the return in the actual index and that of your index fund is lower that's a better metric to pick it but i think this also requires a lot of time investment and research it does. you know what you know what i followed i picked again my advice don't follow it blindly this is just i'm just saying what i've done but don't follow it okay please know what you're doing um i have put sbi sensex icici nifty done har mahine ka whatever i've decided i have to put in 50% in this 50% in that remaining whatever time i have to spend every single day in investment i spend on reading books that what you can see is is just one corner of my room i have at least uh, at least 20 times the number of books and racks in different rooms of of my office and my house so please spend time in reading that's a much better investment but tell me this like so isn't it like risky i think there are some stocks like which are like safe stocks right i mean uh, i i i cannot term it as safe but uh, ITC or uh, Bajaj Auto or Maruti Suzuki. These these don't vary a lot, and since like years, um, so isn't it like a safer bet than these two banks? What okay, I'll take it. Or- I'll 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 explain that with your example of ITC. Why do you think ITC is not increasing over the years? Reason for that is because a great deal of their revenue comes from tobacco and comes from cigarettes, and people feel that okay, we don't want to put money in a business. where a great deal of it is depending on a thin good which is not good for the environment and itc themselves are trying to generate more revenue from their fmcg 
you know, department mm-hmm. ban from this. So if the company strategy, the reason it's not moving is because there's not much happening. And, you know, people, a lot of people don't trust, okay, what is going to happen with ITC? They know it's generating money, but maybe from a future perspective, remember the stock prices move basis future expectations of where the company will go. So if mm-hmm. you put, there's nothing safe in equity, really. If you want safe, put it in like debt mutual funds, put it in government bonds, put it in FD. You will get lesser return than uh, inflation, but it is still safe. Equity is not safe at all. However, for more than 10 years, this is a reel I uploaded this morning. I made this morning. I put it on Instagram so you guys can see it. There are two people. One person starts investing 5,000 rupees per annum at the age of 20 and does it till the age of 30, after which he stops. And he doesn't put any more money, but Joe Lagayatha from 20 to 30, that's just kept in his investment and he's generating 8% per annum. The other guy starts investing at 30, puts in 5,000 per annum and keeps doing that year on year on year till the age of 65 also is getting 85, uh, 8% per annum. The first guy invested only for 10 years. The second guy invested for 35 years. Who is left with more money at, at the age of 65? The first guy. So the basic rule is start early and be invested for the long term. That's the only way to make money. The reason, okay, I'll tell you the reason people say equity mein lagao, paisa banega, zada banega, but most people don't make is because when they go through a downfall, most people in this Zoom meeting right now are those who've just started investing in equities in the past two years. In the past two years, the markets are rising. When say the market falls and 30% of your wealth is wiped off, no, you will not have it in you to be invested. You will be like, fuck it, I'm going to take out this money and put it elsewhere. Yeah, You will not have it in you. The way you will behave when you lose 30% of your wealth is not something you can anticipate or imagine. Which is why wealth creation is a matter of patience. It's a psychology game. Like you need to be patient and know, okay, 30%, 50% of my wealth is gone, but in 10 years, it will still grow which is what most people don't have. So we all see return. We don't, even though we see risk, we only understand our response to risk when we go through it actually. That's where that understanding, that psychology of money is very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've also put the link of the reel that Sarthak was talking about. It's, It's in the chat, so you all can just go ahead and check it out and also give him a follow. He puts up some real good content. Uh, related to this. Um, Sartak, there's one more question, which is, um, so a lot of people had DM me about before the start of this session about home loans, which is at like all time low as of now. Uh, but somebody who doesn't want to commit to a big EMI and like big down payment and all of those things by buying a house in the urban city, should they go out and purchase in a tire two city or something like that just to get the benefit of this low interest rates as of now. What do you recommend people to have it as a real estate investment strategy? Okay. So we're going to break this thing down into several topics so that you understand. Okay. This question, it had several terms which act very differently. One was real estate investment. I'm going to explain that. Second is housing loan interest, which is a separate matter. Starting with housing loan interest, if the interest is low today, that doesn't mean it's going to remain low for the entire duration of your loan. Because if you're taking a 10-year loan or a 20-year loan, 20-year loan is very normal home loan thing. It is floating. It means if tomorrow loan interest increases, even your repayment interest will increase. Okay. Mm. So that's one. So it's not stagnant. Second thing is I would recommend you buy a house only if you need a house for your family to live in. And psychologically, you like the safety of the fact that once I bought it, my family has a place to stay and I don't need to care about paying rent every month. Mm. So from a staying perspective, living perspective, buy a house and do not compare it to an investment. I'll tell you why. It's a psychological investment for psychological benefit, which is also maybe of great significance to a lot of people. What my mother says, okay, Desi Bhaja me hota hai, ki jis ghar ki value hai, kisi zamane me das lakh ka liya tha, aaj ek karod ka hai. Lekin iska matlab ye to nahi hai na, aaj ghar bech ke khao ge. Hmm. 
Yeah. If you're living in a house, you're not going to bloody tokenize it, make an NFT saying buy 10% of my house, give me money. All of that is doesn't happen in India as of now. Yeah. Okay, so you're not going to do that. So buy a house only if you want it to live in. Now, mm-hmm. from an investment perspective, one real estate investment is a game which should come only with deep pockets. My mm-hmm. family has invested in real estate, invested, and I'll tell you the perspective is very different. You can only invest in if you buy an apartment or a flat, you will notice the value does not increase. There is no capital appreciation. So it's not going to give you any return in the future. Mm. Either you have the funds to buy land and land at a location which you expect in the next five years to have sanctioned so much infrastructural growth that it will catch on. So normally real estate ki cycle kya hoti hai? Beach may art sal ekdam se kuch boom aega badega and then it'll be stagnant for 10 years. Hmm. So you need to identify opportunities in land at places where there is going to be infrastructural growth in the next five years. You enter at that point and you take the benefit of that capital appreciation and then you exit and you look for any other opportunity. But remember, it comes with a much bigger ticket size of investment. Hmm. Yeah. So flat to kabhi investment hai nahi. Be it Delhi, Bombay, this, that, any tier two city, buy it to live in if it gives you psychological satisfaction. Hmm. And how much like tax benefit do we get? That's also under ATC only or no, this is separate. So when you pay principal, the principal repayment gets covered under ATC and the interest repayment on housing loan, you get a deduction of if it's self-occupied up to 2 lakh per annum or that as a deduction from your salary also. So you get that benefit, that tax benefit. Right. Okay. But remember that um, investing in real estate is almost like saying FD se thoda upar mil jayega. Matlab, I want to play very safe. Agar sahi jaga pe land le liya mein. Over a long period of time, I will make more than an FD, but I will not be able to match equity returns at all. Hmm. Got it. Uh, there's also one related question to this. Mane is asking apartments can be an investment if we use it to earn rental money. How how does what's the calculation in that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. A residential yield, if you look at rent in India, it will only give you no more than two, three percent per annum as a return, which is horrible. Even an FD gives you more than that. But commercial commercial real estate can actually give you say six, seven percent, which is double than what residential gives you, which is why if someone is looking to, but also remember commercial real estate is more expensive. Mm. Um, So what one may choose to do is invest in REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. So say you you want to invest 5,000 in, uh, in real estate. Mm. So there are three REITs right now listed in India, you can put money in that and uh, they will give you fixed dividend. The dividend comes from the rental that those properties earn. So these are basically portfolio management companies who've bought the prime real estate, commercial real estate in cities like Hyderabad, Bangalore, Gurgaon, Pune. They've given it to lease to like the best of international companies which pay high rents like your Facebook, Google, Microsoft and all that rent is collected and paid off to people who have purchased that REIT. But no, REITs is a new concept. Uh, it is started listing in India and the returns have not been great. Also because you're continuously getting dividend. That dividend is not getting reinvested in your capital. Hmm. So for young people at this stage, I, I normally don't recommend REITs as a great option to invest money in. Got it. Uh, and before we move on to the next question, I know there are multiple other questions that uh, have come in, but we have like a small way that we can sort out this and can take as many questions as we can. We have quickly put up a small post on on Pepper's LinkedIn and if any of your questions are not addressed here, please go ahead and put it in the comments uh, on this post and we'll make sure that whenever Sarthak gets time, he can address these questions in the comment over there. Sarthak, I think one last question we can take, which is uh, here by, uh, I'm just, okay, I'm just going to move into uh, Yes, by Sharad, where, he, where he's asking, is it advisable to invest in dividend stocks as a freelancer as it can be source of passive income? 
Mm, I see. The problem is that for you to get substantial dividends, which contribute to your monthly expenses, your investment will have to be very high. You know, and most freelancers may not have very high, like. 20 30 lakh worth of investment in equities in most cases that's not the case nahi pada work na balance so what you would rather want is that dividend if it does come it gets reinvested again into buying shares of the same company because there's more capital appreciation mm. because wo dividend aa gaya usko maine kharche mein nikal diya to maine usko compound karne ka mauka to diya hi nahi mm. yeah. so if you are picking an investment opportunity pick you have the option of dividend or growth I recommend pick growth because even the dividend that comes, the mutual fund company invests it back into buying more shares into those companies. Hmm. That that is what I would recommend to younger people. Because how much dividend will come? Yeah, it's not going to pay for your monthly rent. Yeah, you will need a very high corpus for it. Hmm. So that's the basic uh, thumb rule to follow here. Got it. I think I think this is the. A... very vast topic and sadly we we just blocked your one hour for it but we'll try and see next time uh, we can you know cover other topics also as to how uh, people can you know increase their business growth their creative businesses and things like that and maybe we'll try and uh, schedule that maybe sometime later and in fact get... what i'd love to do for this for this audience if if pepper also someday feels that there's value in it is i would really want to do a session for freelancers where i'm telling Then okay, what are the levers of sale and marketing that you need to pull and put in your business to actually double the number of leads coming your way, to increasing your sales, to optimizing your costs, to improving your presence online, to be able to get more business. And there are so many tools available, so many avenues which people are not using. Yeah. Also, know that when you are a freelancer, you are self-employed. You are not an entrepreneur. or is this the first stage of being an entrepreneur you actually yeah. become a business owner or an entrepreneur when you hire people to work under you mm. and then you create processes and then you make tech to automate it and mm. income is getting generated while you are chilling and just doing calls and important meetings and looking at mis that's when you become a business owner so i think i feel a great sense of drive in trying to help people move from freelancers to becoming entrepreneurs which i think is something which can be done in two years Yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah, hopefully with yes. paper content, we we're gonna do that master class also. Yeah, I'm I'm just gonna quick take like a quick yes or no. Will folks the thirty forty folks who are here, will you be interested in a session like this? Just put in yes or no in the chat so that we know. Uh, you might be interested, and we'll try our best to. Okay, already three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I think a lot of people are and will be interested to. Uh, Take a session like this. Sarthak, we'll be in touch and probably schedule okay. this sometime in October. But thank you so much, Sarthak, for being here and answering some of these questions for us. I think it was a very, very insightful presentation and session for each one of us. Uh, if any of your questions are not addressed here today in this master class, please just feel free to put it here. I'm I'm just gonna give the link of the LinkedIn post again. Just go ahead, put your questions on this post. and whenever sarthak can find time today or tomorrow can you can just answer uh, your questions back over there but thank you so much once again sarthak and everybody thank else who joined in today uh, thank you for giving us your time on a saturday evening bye bye take care have a good weekend